Welcome AP Bio students to your review of molecular biology and basic chemistry. I'm going to be covering some things that I know will be on your upcoming test. Uh, also, I know these are topics that are focused on on the AP exam. So follow along with me. I will describe some basic things that we didn't cover in class. Anything in your notes or in the reading through chapters 1 through 6 in Campbell Biology is also fair game, but this is supplemental to things that we've covered uh, in the reading and in class. So on my first slide here, you'll notice that I've got a polymer pictured, and this, this particular polymer is known as a starch. Um, starches are made of monomers. Uh, the monomer in this case is glucose, and glucose is a familiar six-sided molecule. Um, we talked about how organic molecules are built and you should be familiar with the, the six-sided hexagon that we usually see uh, glucose drawn as, but we also need to understand that glucose is a three-dimensional molecule. So from a side view, it, it may look like this. Um, and if you follow, it still has six sides. See, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. And you also know that anywhere where they didn't draw a carbon atom, anytime you have an angle on a molecule like this and they don't draw an atom, there's carbon atoms sitting there. Um, and then we can take these monomers of glucose and hook them together end to end, and in this configuration they'd be called a starch. You're also going to need to know about the other polymers of glucose. Uh, for instance, uh, cellulose is an important one, and uh, glycogen is the other important one. Um, and we talked a bit about those in class already, but if you don't know those, I would make sure that I do before your test. Uh, the atoms that make up all organic molecules, including uh, the glucose uh, and, the, and the starch that we just looked at, uh, we have carbon, we have hydrogen, we have oxygen, we have nitrogen, we have phosphorus, and we have sulfur. The easy way to remember that is CHOPS. Those, again, are the atoms that make up the organic molecules. Our organic molecules are the carbohydrates, uh, whose general formula is uh, CH2O. And then we have the lipids, which are just long chains of carbon atoms. Uh, we have the nucleic acids, that's the Na and DNA and RNA, nucleic acid. And finally, we have the proteins, which are go-to, do-everything molecule in the cells. Um, proteins are incredibly versatile and, and rather chemically complex. We'll talk quite a bit about them this year. But all of those molecules, all four of our organic molecules are made out of CHONPS. Um, make sure that you know that P is phosphorus and not potassium. Everybody always wants to tell me it's potassium. That would be K. It's not chunks. It's chomps. Uh, so there you go. Chomps is, is what little girls are made of. Isn't that cute? And, and all living things are made of C-H-O-N-P-S. Make sure you're familiar with those atoms. Uh, and holding together our atoms, to build all of our organic molecules, we have chemical bonds. Those are the forces that hold together our atoms. Uh, the two main types that you need to worry about are covalent bonds, in which electrons are shared between two atoms, and that's what causes the attractive force. We also have ionic bonds, where uh, electrons are going to be gained and lost, resulting in charges between atoms, and opposite charges will attract. So a positively charged ion will be attracted to a negatively charged ion, which will bond the two ions together. Um, Covalent bonds are typically found between two nonmetals. So an example of that would be the bonds that hold water together. Between the hydrogens and the oxygens, we have sharing of electrons that keeps water held together. An example of an ionic bond would be like uh, a salt. Uh, we have a sodium and a chlorine, a metal and a nonmetal. Uh, and those are held together by ionic bonds. Uh, other bonding forces that we talked about in class, we have hydrogen bonds, which are, deal with partial positives and partial negatives on stable molecules. Again, a partial positive will attract a partial negative, but that's a weaker bonding force. It's not nearly as strong as a covalent bond or an ionic bond. Uh, there's also disulfide bonds that we talked about briefly and van der Waals forces. I'd be familiar with all those bonding types. The big important ones, though, are covalent bonds, ionic bonds. At a minimum, make sure you know about those. Ah, uh, this is a scary lion. Uh, and the scary lion is saying, grr, and this brings up something that we haven't talked about much yet, but we'll use it periodically throughout the year, um, and that's redox reactions. And with redox reactions, really what you need to know for the purposes of this class is that Leo says grr. And as long as you remember that Leo says grr, um, that will get you through what you need to know about redox reactions. And and that sounds confusing, but here's here's what I mean by Leo says grr. 
if you lose electrons, it's oxidation. So an atom that has lost electrons or a molecule that has lost electrons, it's an oxidation process. And if it's gained electrons, it's a reduction process. And the easy way I remember that is that electrons have a negative charge. So if I pick up extra electrons, my charge has been reduced. So gaining electrons is reduction. Losing electrons is oxidation. As long as you remember that Leo says Ger, that will help you anytime you run into a redox reaction situation. You need a sharp teeth. Uh, hydrolysis reactions we talked about briefly in class. If I've got a big long polymer made of several small monomers, if I add water, look what I'm doing here, here's water, and I add water in here, one of the H's goes there, one of the OH's goes there, so if I, uh, if I add water, I shorten my polymer. And the opposite would be true as well. If I take out water, then I can lengthen my polymer. Uh, so dehydration reactions are going to lengthen polymers, and hydration reactions are going to shorten polymers. I would know that for sure. Adding water shortens polymers. That's the big take-home message with hydrolysis reactions. Make sure you know what a hydrolysis reaction is. Anabolic reactions. Uh, this is making large molecules from two smaller ones. So see, I've got two small molecules down here. If I do an anabolic reaction, they're going to join. So this is kind of a collective term for any time I'm taking smaller molecules and linking them together to make bigger molecules, I'm forming chemical bonds and anabolic reactions. The opposite would be catabolic reactions, where I take one big molecule and I separate them, breaking a bond. That's a catabolic reaction. So I would know what catabolic and anabolic reactions are. Anabolic are building large molecules. Catabolic is taking apart molecules. Uh, finally, here we've got the uh, a, a, a graph that you'll see a lot of in chemistry. Along here, we have a, some chemical reaction proceeding going forward in time. Over here, we have the uh, energy that's in the chemical bonds. These are the reactants that we're going to start our chemical reaction with. Down here are the products that we're going to finish our chemical reaction with. Um, you could use any uh, exergonic reaction here. Any, any reaction that's going to uh, give up energy to its surroundings could be represented with this graph. I chose gasoline just for fun. Um, but C8H18, that's gasoline, essentially. And if I take gasoline and I add oxygen to it, here's O2, um, I'm going to be able to do a combustion reaction. It's going to release CO2 gas and it's going to release H2O. Notice that the atoms over here are the same atoms that are present when I'm all done. I've just rearranged the atoms. And in the process, I've released energy, so we call it an exergonic reaction. So this is the basic graph of an exergonic reaction. Um, let's, let's look at some parts here. Like I told you, that's the energy present in the bonds you start with. So these are the, the bond energy present in gasoline and oxygen. And down here, I've got the energy present in the bonds I end up with. So that would be everything on my right side of my arrow in my chemical reaction here. Exergonic reactions release energy to their surroundings. How much energy is released? Well, that much. It's uh, everything in this bracket here. That's how much energy I get when I burn gasoline. That's the amount of energy I get to make my wheels go roundy roundy on my car. So that is the energy that gets released. Um, and that, of course, begs the question, then what's up with this little bump right here? That little bump right there is the reason that my, my gasoline doesn't just spontaneously come apart all the time. Um, gasoline doesn't just spontaneously fall apart into carbon dioxide and water, and that's a good thing, because if I was driving down the road and my gasoline just spontaneously decided to come apart, my gas tank would explode, and that would be bad, and I don't want my gas tank to explode. So it's a good thing this exists. This stuff is called activation energy. It's the energy required to start this exergonic reaction. I have to get, uh, my uh, uh, reactants have to get up and over this hump before they'll fall apart into their final products. Um, so activation energy keeps uh, spontaneous reactions from happening. We have to get over the activation energy before the rest of the reaction proceeds. That's an exergonic reaction. Uh, endergonic reactions would be the reverse. So now I start with like carbon dioxide and water over here, and I'm going to build some high energy molecule. I'm going to rearrange these atoms and build glucose, which is C6H12O6. C6H12O6. 
um, same atoms, I'm just going to rearrange them into a higher energy form. That means I'm going to have to input energy. And in the case of uh, this endergonic reaction, since this is the production of glucose, plants are going to do this, and they're going to use sunlight energy to push them up this big, huge hill and add all this energy that's going to become bond energy. So in endergonic reactions, they're going to take in energy from their surroundings uh, to make high energy molecules. Um, but the same thing applies here. It's basically just the, the, the exergonic reaction in reverse. Finally, the last thing you should know, here's the, the same graph drawn a little bit differently, but it's the same graph. Here's my activation energy that it would take to get an exergonic reaction to go forward. Here's my low energy products, my high energy reactants. Um, to get this reaction started, I need to add a fair amount of, of energy here. So if this was a campfire, this is me holding a match to the log to, to start shaking apart the bonds. And then once they start shaking apart, bam, now I've got a fire lit and it'll just keep burning because it's releasing all this energy to its surroundings. Um, the reason I bring up this graph is because they show an enzyme here. And what enzymes are going to do for us is lower activation energy so that this reaction can proceed more easily. So if this is my body trying to break down glucose to release energy, the presence of an enzyme lowers the activation energy and makes it happen easily enough that the, the, uh, the kinetic energy of moving molecules will, will make this reaction proceed. I, I don't need to add a whole lot of extra activation energy to make it go. That's what enzymes do for us. They are proteins that speed up chemical reactions. And without enzymes, uh, the chemistry of life just would never happen. The activation energies would be too high, and all the chemical reactions in your body wouldn't go fast enough. And, and life wouldn't be possible. So enzymes are these really important proteins, and what they do is they lower activation energy. And that, I believe, is it. Those are our flying cats. Um, that's everything you need to know about chemistry, uh, well, in addition to what we covered in notes and what we uh, what's in the reading in Chapters 1 through 6 in Campbell, uh, minus the flying cats. You don't need to know anything about flying cats. Um, that is all. If you have any questions, feel free to email me, uh, rissy at westernschools.org, and uh, feel free to stop in and talk to me anytime if you're confused about anything, and uh, good luck studying. Have a nice night.